Thank you. Uh, because of your incredible uh, generosity, uh, this week we will send our first uh, contribution to the uh, uh, orphanage in Uganda. My dear friends in Uganda, you're going to get something from us that will be a blessing to you this week. Our dear Heavenly Father, uh, we're trying to learn how to live with a gritty faith. We're trying to develop an internal discipline that makes us competent especially when things are hard and the pressure's on. And I pray that you would whisper to our hearts today and guide us in your good way. In Christ's name, amen. It sounds a little hot to me. The mic sounds a little hot. I recently read a book by John Meacham called And There Was Light. It's a study of Abraham Lincoln and the Emancipation Proclamation. Meacham shows that when uh, Lincoln started his political career in Illinois, slavery was just a, a political problem to him. He only saw it as a, uh, a political uh, problem, that America could not realize its full potential with slavery. But when he became elected president, uh, his sense of the moral evil of slavery started to rise. Uh, Lincoln grew up, uh, his dad was a really, really, really strict, angry Baptist. And Lincoln, uh, he couldn't live with that. And so he, he kind of gave up on religion. And then he was elected president, and he went to Washington, and his son Willie caught typhoid fever and died within two weeks. And it wrecked Lincoln. He had been attending uh, the uh, Presbyterian Church near the White House, and the pastor there was uh, Dr. Phineas Gurley. And um, uh, Lincoln and Dr. Gurley would take uh, a walk a couple of times a week, and uh, Dr. Gurley would talk to Lincoln about spiritual things. Out of these conversations, Lincoln came to see slavery as a sin as a moral insult to God. And because he saw it as a moral insult to God, instead of just uh, a political problem, it started pressing on Lincoln's sense of values. And one day he sat down at his desk and wrote the Emancipation Proclamation. He folded it up, put it in an envelope, and put it in his desk. And Lincoln wasn't one to do this. It's the only time I read that he ever did it. Uh, he said to God, uh, if you want me to issue this Emancipation Proclamation, I need some kind of affirmation from you. And so uh, Lincoln said, we're losing all the battles. If you want me to issue this Emancipation Proclamation, then the next time the, the North wins a battle, when it's over, I will, I will issue the Emancipation Proclamation, and we will give slavery a, 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 a death blow. Several weeks later, Robert E. Lee and the Army of the Rebellion invaded Maryland. 
And the most bloody day in American history happened at the Battle of Antietam. But when the Battle of Antietam was over, Lee retreated, and the North had one of its first victories in the East in the whole war. And Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation. Some of you know it, he risked his whole presidency. People told him, if you do this, you'll lose the support of half your soldiers. You'll lose the support of states. Uh, people will pull out of the war. They threatened him with everything. But it had gone way beyond politics for Lincoln. Now it was about his moral values. And Lincoln said, because of my moral values, I'm willing to risk my whole political career because my values demand it. Church, that is values grit. Where your values are so compelling to you, no matter what the external pressures are, you obey your values instead of conforming to peer pressure. I'd like to talk to you today about values grit. Values grit is a way of deciding to do the right thing when the pressure's on. Values grit says, I live by my values, especially when it's hard. And it turns out in the Bible, we have a wonderful lesson on values grit. If you study the history of the early church, the church grew rapidly in Jerusalem. On the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people became a Christian. Shortly thereafter, the church grew to 5,000 people. And then the problem started. Herod killed James with a sword just as amusement for the angry people in Jerusalem. Stephen baffled the Sanhedrin, and a mob drug him down through the streets of Jerusalem, threw him outside the wall, and stoned him to death. The pressure was so great in Jerusalem that Christians began, one by one, leaving the city. And the church in Jerusalem, under all that pressure and with everybody leaving, it began to get smaller and smaller. But the church in Antioch, Syria, it was exploding. In the very same way that the church in Jerusalem had grown, the church in Antioch was growing by leaps and bounds every day. And then the tension arose. In Jerusalem, almost all the Christians were Jewish. In Antioch, most of the Christians were non-Jewish. And it created a giant conflict. Because on top of this, a great many Pharisees had become Christians. And the pastor of the church in Jerusalem was James, the half-brother of Jesus, and he sided with the Pharisee Christians. He sided with the idea that to be a Christian, you have to obey a whole bunch of Jewish rules. And now there is a huge tension. How, if you're not Jewish, if, you, if you're a Greco-Roman, from the Greco-Roman culture, how Jewish do you have to be to be a Christian? Um... Peter already had experience with this. If you remember, uh, 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 Peter went to the house of Cornelius, the Roman centurion. And he was guided there by the Holy Spirit. And he preached the gospel to Cornelius and his family and his friends and the soldiers. And the whole, the whole group became Christians. And the Holy Spirit fell on them the very same way he fell on the Jewish people at the day of Pentecost. When Peter went back to Jerusalem, James and the Pharisees, 
got ugly with him. And they said, what are you doing going to the house of a Roman soldier? You, that's against all our rules. You can't be hanging around with those people. And Peter said, well, I'm sorry. The Holy Spirit led me there, and I couldn't do anything about it when the Holy Spirit decided to save them in the very same way he saved us. So if you have an issue, you better take it up with God because it was his choice. And this church in Antioch was getting bigger and bigger. Uh, it was so big that they didn't have enough pastors. Uh, Barnabas went to Tarsus and got Paul and asked him to come back and be one of the pastors at Antioch. And then a Peter came from Jerusalem to make sure everything was the way it was supposed to be in Antioch. And when he got there, he was overwhelmed with the sense of, God is in this place. Good things are happening. He was actually enjoying himself. He would actually eat supper with Gentile people. He'd have coffee with Gentiles in the morning. Uh, he was fitting in to this multi-ethnic church. And everything went fine till James heard that Peter was hanging around with Gentiles at the church of Antioch so you know what he did? He sent some of the strict guys, the Pharisee Christians, up to Antioch to get things straight. And when they showed up, Paul tells us in the book of Galatians, Peter was intimidated and he separated himself and he wouldn't have supper with the Gentiles anymore. And he wouldn't hang around with them. He treated them as if they were unacceptable and unclean. When Peter did it, the people around him saw it, like Barnabas, and they said, well, if Peter's separating himself, we better do the same thing. And it created a giant, ugly moment in the church. Peter did not have the grit to live up to his values. He was intimidated by peer pressure. But as you might guess, Paul did have the grit to live up to his values. And one day at church, he called Peter out, and he said, I don't know what you're thinking. If you claim to be Jewish, and you are as biased and prejudiced as, uh, uh, as, as, as you can possibly be, why would you expect anyone to be like you? And now we have this big principle. If we're going to try to influence the world for good, and we don't have the values grit to live up to our values, and we can be intimidated by peer pressure, why would we expect anyone to have confidence and faith in the church? Do you see the point? If we're going to be influential for good in the world, we have to be people who know what our values are, and we have the grit to live out our values wherever God puts us and whatever peer pressure we feel. You see, the backstory to Antioch is the whole story. And the same thing is true in our lives. What makes it hard for us to have values grit? Well, we all have a backstory. Everyone in this room has felt peer pressure about something. Church? Uh, uh, and it can be nonsense, but it's peer pressure. Uh, when I was a, a, a junior high boy, I had uh, some kind of infection in my feet, and I couldn't wear um, colored socks. I could only wear white socks. Well, the trouble is, when I was in junior high, nobody wore white socks. You were, uh, you were uh, an oddball if you wore white socks. Uh, now that's all I wear. Uh, 
but because of the dye, I, I, uh, I felt humiliated because I had to wear white socks, peer pressure, right? Everybody in this room has had a moment in your life where you were uh, under the gun with peer pressure. Some of you have it at work every week. Some knucklehead has to give you grief because they know you love God. You see, if I'm going to live by values grid, I have to come to terms with uh, there's going to be peer pressure. But I value my values more than I value their petty, stupid opinions. There's also the backstory of we all have internal flaws. It's not just external peer pressure, it's my internal flaws that uh, make it hard for me to live by my values. Uh, I don't know how many times I've said to myself, I will never say that again. It guess how often I live up to it. Next thing I know, I hear myself, there it is, coming out of my mouth. Church, we have internal flaws, and these internal flaws make it hard for us to live by our values. Everyone in this room has uh, painful memories. Everyone in this room has a painful memory of trying to do something right and good and it not working out. You tried to do something good, you tried to do the right thing, and it brought grief to you. And it makes it hard for us to live by our values. Every one of us have regrets. We remember something and we regret it. What are we regretting? We're regretting failures to live up to our own values. Why do I regret it? Because I had a, a values expectation of myself and I didn't live up to it. And now I think if I, if I fail to live up to my values in the past, uh, what makes me think I'm going to be able to live up to my values now? Everyone has values problems because we have spoken and unspoken fears. And probably I want to push hardest on this one. We have trouble with our values because we have unexamined traditions. We have unexamined traditions. Values were passed to us from a tradition and we've never really examined them. You see, uh, uh, I grew up in an environment where dancing was considered sin. Uh, well, my, my dancing is so bad it is sinful, but uh, uh, okay. That was just a tradition, church. Can you hear this? That wasn't, a, that, that wasn't a core value in my life. That was just a tradition that got passed to me. Uh, uh, Sharon and I went some years ago with a bunch of other people in this church and we learned how to do swing dancing. Well, Sharon learned how to do swing dancing and I learned to be the big dumb guy that stood there while she whirled around. Uh, do you see, there are traditions that get pushed off on us that affect our values that we've never really examined. Do you see? If I'm, going to, if I'm going to have values grit, if I'm going to be the man I say I should be when the pressure's on, then there has to be a time in my life when I get serious about really examining what are my values? What do I really believe? What do I stand for? What, what have I accepted and never even considered it? So, I'm going to lead you through a process that you can use to examine your values. Uh, do you think that would be helpful? All right, let's start with the first one. 
Number one, you have to require yourself to think and evaluate. Can you hear this? This church does not have very many rules, but we do believe everyone in this church ought to have Christian values that they've thought about and committed themselves to. And they live by those values, not because somebody in the church is looking over their shoulder, but because that who is they, who they genuinely and honestly want to be. You're going to have to take time, you're going to have to sit down, and you're going to have to think about your values. You're going to have to evaluate. And listen, no one can do this for you. I can't write you a list of values that you put on your refrigerator and look at every day. They have to come from your own uh, self-examination. Two, how do I begin to think about this? I start asking myself, what do I, eva what do I value? What is important to me? What is it that I want to do with my life? What kind of person do I want to become? How do I want to treat the people around me? All right, now listen. This is where we have to do our own homework and not just accept that somebody said, I should uh, be this kind of person. That won't work when the pressure's on. And once I start figuring out my values, then I have to determine uh, th uh, their relationship to my other values. I value my dog. A dog is a ridiculous, beautiful creation of the Lord God Almighty. We read the Greek New Testament every day together. I read, she sits there. But we're doing it together. All right. But I tell you what, I don't value that dog nearly as much as I value Shay. If it ever was between Shay and the dog, the dog would be on the grill. I have a system of values, and I value Shay a lot more than I value Zoe. Church? All right. Have you taken time in your life to start thinking about your values? What do you value? And what do you value more? What is most important? What comes first? Where are you willing to make compromises? And where are you totally unwilling to make compromises? Four. How does your sense of decency influence your values? See, everybody sitting in this room has an internal sense of decency. This is the decent thing to do. A decent person would do this, right? Uh, you've already developed that in your life. It's already there. Now you just have to start looking at it and saying, what do I think a decent person would do? That internal sense of decency is telling me what my values are. Do you see? I saw a guy last week on the news, a lady, it was, the stroller was rolling down the hill, she fell down, this guy didn't know anybody, he didn't know any of them, but he ran and grabbed that stroller. He didn't sit and think, should I go get that stroller? His internal sense of decency prompted him, and he just went and saved the stroller. The baby was in it, too. It wasn't just the stroller. All right. See, we have this sense, we have this internal sense of decency, and if we'll look at it real hard, it will clarify some of our values. Five, what principles do you live by? By principles, I mean things like honesty. Is honesty a value to you? Or are you honest when it works best to be honest, and when it's easier to get by and not be honest, uh, you'll do that. See, we have principles that says, if honesty is one of my principles, it's one of my values, it means I sense I should be honest all the time, not just when it's convenient for me. Are you, uh, 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 faithfulness is a value. Are, are you faithful? Can people count on you? Do you show up when you say you'll show up? Or are you one of those kind of people that yes means 
maybe if I feel exactly right when the time comes. Friendship. Is friendship with you value, of value with you? We live in the throwaway culture. We will cancel each other after years of friendship because one little thing doesn't go the way we want it to. Church, friendship has to be a value. It can't be based upon, I'll be your friend as long as you accommodate me in everything I want. Six, what does your relationship to Christ require of you? See, my values are very much connected to my personal relationship to Jesus Christ. My values are often expressions of what I think Christ express, <laughs> expects of me, church. Seven, if you ask the people who know you best in your daily life, what would they say you stand for? If I ask your spouse, what do you stand for? What have you lived out in the kind of way that they would say clearly, this is your value because they've seen you stand for it in your life? Or what won't you stand for? You see, I can tell my values by the track record I have, and people can look at my life and say, that guy stands for this. But I tell you right now, he won't stand for this. Those are expressions of our values. All right. I will never have values grit until I determine my own values. You see? Values are not what I have to do because somebody told me I had to do it. Values are me saying, I want to be this kind of man. And because I want to be this kind of man, I have to do these things and I can't do these things. Are, are you starting to hear it? Values is a promise that you make to yourself about the kind of person you're going to be and the kind of person you're not going to be. And when you make that kind of commitment to yourself, it gives you the chance to be gritty when the pressure's on. When I feel the impulse to be dishonest, if I say, I said, I am an honest man, and I value honesty, and now in this moment, no matter what happens, I got to live that out. I have a chance of having a gritty faith. If I've never committed myself, if I've never promised myself, you're an honest man, and I expect you to be honest in all things, when the pressure's on, it'll just be a whole lot easier to get flaky. Are you hearing me, church? then values create a life of integrity. If I live by my values, I'm living a life of integrity. I want to recommend to you uh, Henry Cloud's book called Integrity. It is an incredible book. I promise you, you would profit from reading it. What is integrity? It's integrating my values into my daily life. You see? So I say I value being trustworthy. When I integrate that value into my life and day after day I act in a trustworthy way, I have integrity. When I say I'm going to be trustworthy and I don't make decisions that are trustworthy, I have no integrity. Are you here in this church? Integrity is a result of you and I determining our values and then in a day-to-day -day making choice after choice after choice that integrates those values into our daily life. In Galatians 2.14, Paul said, I saw that they did not walk straight toward the truth. That is a pre-psychological vocabulary for they did not have integrity. They did not walk straight toward the truth. Are you walking straight toward the truth that you have said to yourself about the kind of person you, you want to be? You see, I should 
does not equal I will. Do you know that? Saying I should do this doesn't mean I will. Values grit turns I should into I will. I am making a personal commitment to myself. It's not what I should do. It's what I'm absolutely going to do because I have values grit. How about if we talk about it this way? Values are qualities of life and behavior that you want. Grit is the self-discipline to do those things under pressure. Values are, this is the kind of person I want to be. Grit is, this is the self-discipline I have to be that person when the pressure's on. Ultimately, values grit requires that we take full responsibility for our choices. You get that? There has to come a time in our life when we grow up and we stop blaming everybody else. At my age, if I don't have values grit, it's my own darn fault. There's nobody left to point the finger at other than the dude I look at in the mirror every day. You hear this? If you don't have values grit, it's not your spouse's fault, it's not your parents' fault, it's not your siblings' fault, it's not the people you work with's fault. We all have to get up one day and say, I take full responsibility for my life. These are my values, and I'm going to kill myself living these things out. And when I fail to live up to my values, I'm going to take personal responsibility, and I'm not going to blame it on the people around me. Church? My mentor, Charles Spurgeon, said, Your real character no one can injure but you yourself. Church, it's not what other people think and say about you that ruin you. It's what you know about yourself that has the potential to ruin you. Or it's what you know about yourself that says, I don't care what they say, I know that's not who I am. And then if you'll permit me, because I'm a Christian, I'm accountable to Jesus Christ for my values. It's not just that I'm accountable to myself. I'm accountable to Jesus Christ for my values. You see, I'm trying to be the kind of person that he can depend upon. And when I live by my values, I'm the kind of person he can depend upon. When I'm not living by my values, how can I expect Christ to depend upon me? Church? When I don't have integrity, how can I expect Christ to depend upon me? I'm not just accountable for values grit to myself. I'm also accountable to live by my values because I've not just made promises to myself. I've made promises to Jesus Christ. I've said to Christ, because you have so much values grit. I want to be like you and have values grit myself. I've said to Jesus Christ, because you knew, because you full well knew that you went to Jerusalem, that you would be betrayed to the chief priest. You knew that the chief priest would, would automatically condemn you. You knew that they would give you over to Pilate. You knew that you would be mocked and spit on and whipped. You knew that you would be crucified. And you had the values grit to do it anyway. I want to be more like you. Church. Christ's great value for you and I made him so gritty, he endured the cross, despising the shame. Church, when I say I want to live by values, I'm saying I want to be more like my Lord Jesus Christ. 
I want to have more of the quality of grit that he had. I want my values to have the final say in every decision I make. And I want those values to be profoundly influenced by Jesus Christ. I believe you could write yourself a declaration of independence. I believe you could sit down and declare yourself free from slavery to habits that are against your values. I believe you can sit down and declare yourself free from the peer pressure that you have uh, given into in the past. And you simply sit down in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ and you say, today, I declare myself a person of gritty faith. Today, my values become my pathway to freedom from habits that I hate and are wrecking my life. Today, my values become a freedom bell that rings clearly when the peer pressure's on. And today, through the grace of my Lord Jesus Christ, I'm going to live by my values in a new way so that I can have a Christ-like influence in the world and I can be part of God's good cause in the days to come. Our dear Heavenly Father, I am sorry for the times I have not lived up to my values. I'm sorry for the memories I have that I just folded. But I'm praying for myself today, and I'm praying for everyone in this room. I'm praying that we'll get a fresh start. I, I, I'm praying that we could experience a declaration of freedom. Freedom from the tyranny of bad habits. Freedom from the tyranny of peer pressure. Living under the beauty, the strength, the joy of solid values. I pray it would make a difference in our own lives. I pray it would make a difference in our families. I pray that it would make a difference in our friendships. I pray that it would make a difference in our workplace. And I pray that it would make a difference in this church. And I ask it all through Jesus Christ, our Lord.